professional. Completely not. Uh, so, um, well, it's Wednesday and it's time for us to have a few more drinks again. Um, just to our employers, yes, we are working. This is very important things we're doing. Um, <laughs> well, we, we, we like to think so. Um, you better move into shot and Dan's probably slightly in as well. Okay, so um, we are looking now at a particular winery. Uh, when I say winery, these guys have been working with us for quite a few years now. This is Pirate Cruise Wine. This is Dirk and Jennifer. And your phone doesn't know how to turn down, does it? It doesn't want to. No, it really doesn't. Um, so this is Dirk and Jennifer's. Uh, they're business partners. And I've got it on both sides. <laughs> Stereo. <laughs> there we go. Yes, we're all technical, as you can tell from Time my phone. How think. grey I am, and you know. So, boomer I am. Anyway, um, so this is Pirate Crew. Now, you can't really talk about Pirate Crew without talking about different business models inside of the wine industry. Now, when I first got into the wine industry, I thought uh, that all wineries were, they owned their own vineyards, they made the wine, they put the wine into the bottle in their facility, bottled it, and then sold it out to the distributors to for us to sell. Over the years, I found that is probably the exception more than the rule. So most wineries, uh, let's, uh, let's take Brock and Jack as an example. So Brock and Jack is Trevor Harches. He owns all his own vineyards, so he's got 40 acres. Um, he make, he uh, looks after all the grapes. Um, the wines, however, are, once he harvests, um, he takes it to a winemaking facility at Joe Irvine's. She then makes the wine, um, and then it gets bottled at... Does any other bottling plant now? He's getting a bottling plant, he hasn't got it yet. Okay. Uh, at, uh, I think it's not, not Pro Wine, it's Vinpack. Um, and then sells from there, and then goes to the distributor, which comes to us and sells. So he is basically a grape grower that has wine under his own label. Um, someone like uh, St. Hallett, when I was there many, 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 many years ago, uh, had their own vineyards, um, but did contract in other grape, um, other vineyards to buy as well to, to in, increase the sizes and things. They actually made it on their own facilities, they made all the wine in the in their winemaking facility, uh, and then would send it off to their distributor, which went to us, etc. So, as you can probably see, really it comes down to where the grapes come from. Are they yours or they're someone else's, or are they a bit of both? And some most wineries kind of get those those kind of things together. Um, and or, something like soul growers who, who um, all just, source all yeah. their stuff from growers that they've yeah. got relationships with. Yes, we are. So that's so they buy all their grapes. Um, someone else might buy some of the grapes and have their own grapes and then the final boutique wineries which is kind of ones we do a fair bit with as well um, basically just grow their own grapes yeah. so that's one area then you've got the next area which is the wine making and you can get a your own full contract uh, your own wine making facility with your own winemaker be it your owner or whatever can be there or you can actually have a contract winemaker making wine for you in your facility. Or you can subcontract to another facility and actually get the winemaker there to make it for you. Or you can subcontract in a facility and get uh, your own winemaker to do it for you. So that's they're the, the sort of the breakdown parts. And business models pick and choose out of those quite a bit. Um, in some years, in good years, really, really good years, uh, you're going to have guys who are buy, who are making their own wine and Sorry. selling it out, um, and probably Sorry. Sorry. selling grapes to other people. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's quite a lot. There's quite a different business model. These guys, Pirate Crew, is actually a. They don't own wineries. They buy grapes. They don't have a winemaking facility, but they can't get a winemaking. They contract to a winemaking facility, oh, yeah. and they have a contract winemaker, That's but they nice do enough. all of the notations and um, stylistically the notes for themselves, right. which means that they make the wine they want to make. 
using the facilities that they rent, the contract winemaker they have, and the grapes that they want to buy. They actually do source the grapes, but they have long-term relationships with, and a lot of the time it's hand pruned. So when we're talking about the wines themselves, we're looking at something that's generally um, hand-selected bunches, uh, in small vats, um, I think, what was it she said to me? I think they needed like two or three barrels of, of wine, um, of, one particular, of, of one vintage generally. That's not many, that's you know, it's not a huge amount. Um, but these are all very unique, very hard to get hold of, um, very small production quantities. Now, I think I've got them in the wrong order here, if you want to So let's just swap number two with number one, please. Okay, so what we're looking at today is a range of the do. Now, if you're looking for pirate crew wines, you need to look for names like Dante Gabriel, William Hunt, uh, Imp's Delight, uh, Sin of the Mermaid. And generally, they're on the neck tag, they and now on the bottle top, they've got like a... Oh, it's Drag two sea dragons on a with a crested shield um, as their logo. Uh, look for the word pirate crew on the wine as well. When I first ran into them, they did a plethora of wines with pirate crew hidden somewhere in the name. Yeah. Um, and in fact, you had to know what they made, which made it really difficult. Now they've actually improved their marketing, particularly, and they're now getting a bit more of a, uh, a following behind them because they're building a brand. That being said, they've been doing it for, how long have we been having now? Slurpy Puppy's the other one too. Slurpy Puppy's another one of their, their, their wine labels you should always keep an eye out for. Um, how long have we been? About five years? Yeah, five, six years? It's been a while. Um, when they first came to me and they showed me the wines, we were like, hey, that's good, hey, that's good, hey, that's good, hey, that's good, let's take a lot. Um, and then we've consistently rolled through it ever since. The price points for them are a little bit up there. Generally, the cheapest ones are about 24, 25 bucks. The average price for them is about 30. Um, we do put them on special occasionally for 25. The and the, the slurpy puppies, they're sort of the entry level type thing. They're they're generally between 23 and 25. The William Hunt range and the Dante Gabriel is about 30. Uh, but we do them at 25 quite regularly. But these are drinking well above the price point. So we're going to look today, uh, starting with the Grenache. This is the William Hunt Grenache. Now, William Hunt Grenache is that one there. So the labelling itself, is, it's just a good solid label. It's actually quite a market looking label. Good rag, good bottle, decent punt. It's quite a decent punt. Mm. Um, so they do use good quality in their uh, production. And almost all the stuff's out of Barossa, though. There's some out of Langhorn Creek um, and sometimes Adelaide Hills, as they were getting to John Malay out of Adelaide Hills. And this is Grenache. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is the Grenache. So, as we love Grenache, what's your take on it, Dan? Excellent acid. Now it's yep. water instantly. Yep. Good fruit, very light tannin. Mm hmm. It's pretty much ticking all the boxes of what a Grenache is. Yeah, it should actually have, you know, it, it should be a medium to light body wine. It should have forward fruit. Um, it should be good acidity. It needs that good acidity, otherwise it gets a little bit stodgy. Um, it's quite warming. It is quite warming. That's, uh, Grenache will produce alcohol fairly early in its um, verizon, in, in its, um, its lifespan. Um, Pat, with a sly wink, what do you... Uh, um, yeah, I quite, um, yeah, I like this one. It's, um... Yeah, it likes it, doesn't love it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Once you get to the Monty. Once you get to the Monty, yeah. you'll love it. Oh, well, the Monty is... Uh, I remember the one where they had the blue label for the Monty, and that, yeah. was, that was my go-to for that a was, while. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of people's go-to. The thing is, though, that just when you're looking at it, it still has intensity, it has depth, it has complexity. Um, none of these wines are just acceptable. They're all drinking well above acceptable. So, you know, we're, we're looking at, yeah, again, it's got enough tannin to make it interesting, but the acidity and the fruit balance is beautiful. And should what, what vintage is it? These are actually, uh, yeah, look at the vintage, please, Dan, because my eyes are gone. 
2016 for the Grenache. Now this was probably the last of the 16 Grenache as well, I believe we picked up the last of The reason we're doing this is because I just, just got my allocation order from them um, last week. Uh, on Saturday, actually, which is a weird time to get it, but yeah, they, they actually hand deliver their stuff, so mm -hmm. I was pretty happy with that. Um, but yeah, very, very good, solid wine. Um, happily put that up against most of our other Grenaches. Hello, one second. Probably the only thing the difference is with the Langmile. Remember the Langmile we all yeah, love? Yeah, the Diamond. Yeah, the Diamond. We all sort of went, wow, it was a lot of oak to it. The oak expression in this is a little less, which is kind of good because it's a bit more balanced. We all loved it because it was yeah. an oak character. We like oak oak, so. But again, okay. eminently well balanced, great acidity, good fruit, mm. can't, can't beat that, that's just lovely. Yeah, it's perfect, um, um, especially like a wine for right now, summer's ending, the mm. dinners. Um, yeah, I'd put that with any, most dinners I'd have. Yeah. Actually, that's a good part about Grenache. I, um, I throw it with everything from spaghetti bolognese to a full steak. Um, yeah, it's just lovely. The, the only drama that we've got is in our household is that Ros and I have been, uh, you know, we will have a glass of wine each with dinner and maybe one more if it's a particularly good one and we sort of leave the bottle for the next day. But now we've got a grown-up child in the house. We uh, have a tendency to not have any wine left the next day. It's a little concerning, really. There's always another bottle. Yeah, I know there's always another bottle, but someone has to buy it, and yeah. generally it's, it's, he's had a chip in now. <laughs> so the next one is the Dante Gabriel. So from what I gather, when in the discussion that I've had, they've actually chosen Dante Gabriel as being their oddity expressions. So William Hunt um, is their, their standard good solid expressions of Barossan wines or um, wines um, that, they, they, that everyone knows. Dante Gabriel gives that little bit left turn, so we're looking at a Montepulciano. So, um, Montepulciano, Dan, oh, sorry, Pat, uh, what's, what have you remember at Monty? Um, can't remember actually much, it's been a like, while since I've had one. Go uh, back to the really basics, so where's the grape originally from? Uh, Italy. Well so, done, that's it. Yeah, um, the north, yep. north, northwest, was it? East. Oh, east, yeah. yeah northeast of Italy. Yeah. Um, Montepulciano is a is a great varietal. It's also a uh, Montepulciano um, di Abruzzo, and there's also a Montepulciano uh, Nobile di Montepulciano, which is a Sangiovese, which is confusing. Yeah. Um, but this is a Montepulciano. The style is actually aimed at the Montepulciano di Abruzzo. Um, yeah. So, uh, what do you remember about the style? As it's northern Italy, it's going to be a little bit warmer. It will not more fruit. Um, should have um, bigger, blacker yeah. fruit. Yeah. Um, touch. And just the nose. And, oh wow. Just a bit more fruit, less acid. Or? Generally, if you're having an Italian one, there will be a little bit more fruit, a little bit less acid. But it still has the acidity and fruit balance, and that's really important because. In Italy, they're trying to get fruit into it because they're already getting enough acidity into it. Mm. Um, and this wine is particularly like a, a well-loved, easy-drinking style of wine. You can get some absolutely top-end expressions, but for the most part, when you're in Italy itself, you, if you're order, if you're in Piedmont, you're a Barbera or the entry level, uh, you, or they're, they're coughing sort of drinking wine. Montepulciano in, in Veneto is the other one. But that being said, though, it's a great wine. Um, it doesn't command huge prices in the country, in Italy, but it commands massive prices outside of it. The expression that we're looking at today, um, cuttings taken from Italy, brought into Australia by the CSIRO, who do a lot of work. Um, the more I've actually dealt with the wine industry, the more I've discovered that CSIRO, the Australian government, um, uh, the Australian government scientific branch, has worked really long and hard making sure that none of these varietals are going to become pests, mm. to make sure that they are viable in our wine industry and, in, and that's working hand in hand with the Australian wine industry. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I'm really, really impressed with... Um, it's good to see my tax money going somewhere for yeah. my drinking. Yeah, actually yeah. 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 So anyway, Monty, this one. The nose on this is absolutely beautiful. So, what do you think? This is 2017 as well. I think this is, yeah, 2017. 
it smells like, like it was a little bit of toast. 16. Oh, 16, yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is five years old. So you will have some tertiary notes going into it. Mm. But it's still so fresh. Mm. Right. You know, we're not looking at a wine that's been made still, to age still quickly. Of fruit, though. It's still heaps of fruit. Um, there are ways you can actually get your wines to look older when they're younger. And that's like oxidation. Oh, that microoxidation yeah. you can get. Or you can even um, add compounds to it to age it quickly. Um, uh, but this one here, um, they actually have a st barrel storage. They, they keep a storage unit and they, they bottle not on vin they bottle at vintage, but they, they bottle generally on previous years. So you're not going to be seeing, well, you don't generally see from these guys a 2020 wine. I mean, these, that's what I'm saying. When you're buying these wines, you are buying something that's got age. It's got winemaking. It's and it's got long term, right? yeah. left in barrel. Yeah. Till they break. Till they Yeah, they don't have a facility, so therefore they don't have a big batch of storage. So these are barrel, and they're barrel aged for quite a while. So you should get lovely secondary characters. Um, you should also get some nice tertiary characters setting up as well. Which means you're buying a wine essentially for 30 bucks, which, yeah. you know, you'd normally have to be. Drinks like a 50 or 50, 50, 50, 50 bucks. Yeah. Very dry. Mm. Mm. But again, just sort of sits there and rests around your cheeks and you yep. under your tongue. Mm. This is one of my favourite fruit wines. Mm. This is actually probably what I'll take home for my bolognese. Right. It's got a good finish on it. Oh. So, black fruit up front, quite dense. Acidity is there, but the tannin is actually really round. And it, it, like you said, it envelops your mouth. Beautiful wine. Um, it finishes. It's got a uh, some complexity in the finish, and it finishes about medium length. It's not, not an incredibly long finish, but you know the alcohol is not overriding, the oak isn't overriding, the tertiary notes there. There's a bit of leather, a bit of earthiness, a touch of meatiness in there as well. Mm. Yeah, it ticks all my boxes. Uh, Any, anything you've got to add to that? Nothing. Nothing with a slow wink. No. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, young Cree. <laughs> so, do you like that one? Yeah, I think I should prefer the um the yeah. Grenache to it. Mm -hmm. I just reckon. I like the acidity in the Grenache. Yeah, mm -hmm. but right now, um, yep. I think it's perfect weather for a Grenache. Yeah. Actually, if you go back and taste the Grenache again, you'll find the acidity is a lot higher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. oh yeah. And it is. It's it's kind of like going from you know a heavy IPA style beer almost. Getting back to those sours that we, we really enjoyed, that, that acidity, that pH. Now we're going on to what I think is classically Barossa's breast grape, which is a Shiraz. So William Hunt Shiraz. Now, I don't know the vineyards that these come off. I've asked. They've given me sly hints and said things. But um, the way I believe it started... Now, if Jennifer and Dirk are watching this, and I get this wrong, I'm really sorry, but this is the way it was kind of related to me was that the guys worked inside the wine industry doing their various bits and bobs. And I think it was Jennifer was in, I think, Angston Pub or somewhere like that one day. And literally the uh, big companies had just culled contracts left, right and centre. So they, there's this really good viticulture, really good grapes that had been harvested. But the guys are like, Oh my God, we've got no one to sell to because you know, the big company's gone, nah, we don't want it, it's all good. We've got enough. We've got enough. Or, you know, or it could be even be, oh, we've got enough RWT or enough BIN, you know, BIN 35, whatever, they, whatever. And they've gone, yeah, we don't need your grapes. And this guy who spent all year growing these grapes, getting them ready, and then said, would you like to have some now? And they've gone, nah, no, it's all, we, there's a glut of grape, we don't need it. Um, yeah, and he's suddenly got no money. He has to sell them. And you've got really sort of two choices. One, you can sell them to, I think it's uh, Warren Randall, who buys and pretty much sets all the pricing for um, bulk juice, which means that your premium quality grapes, which even if they're A-grade grapes, so you're going to probably get 8 to $12 a litre, depending on the vintage. Yeah. Um, you're really struggling to get anything at all. Uh, you can try and sell them, I guess. 
And Jennifer said, oh, well, look, what's, what's, a good, what's a fair price? And he said, a fair price. She said, yep, no worries, we'll buy them. Um, might have been her and Dirk, because I'm sure she would have actually gone, hey, we need to put some money together, let's get it going. And they decided to make their first wines. Um, and I believe it was, you know, that was sort of how they started. So they've actually formed relationships with growers over the last, well, at least 10 years, I can think of, yeah. where they've, they've helped out. And obviously over time, growers will suddenly become the flavour of the month again and they'll go, oh, no, 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 we're not going to sell to you anymore, we're going to sell back to here. But I think that probably does a detriment to them <laughs> because what actually happens is three years later, they get dropped again and they're suddenly coming begging for, for uh, oh, can you buy our grapes again, please? No. So... Also, I realised that um, that sounds a bit sounds like anyone could do it, but you know, you need to actually have the contacts in the industry. You need to know who can help you out and who who can make the wine, essentially. But I believe that's how they started, which I think is kind of a bit of a, a Peter Lehman story for me. So that's that that kind of someone suffering. They stepped in to help, and it was a benefit for everybody. So yeah, pretty impressive. So Shiraz, this is a Barossa Shiraz. Okay. That's a lovely dense Shiraz. Mm. A lot of oak on that one. I'd say they put uh, with with their Shiraz. I believe they use a, a quite a bit more new oak into their, their Shiraz, and it obviously stays for an extended period of time. What year? Uh, 2016. 2016. That's five years old. It's bright, it's fresh, yeah, it's going to be, well, as we were talking the other day in the, um, we had a, a meeting with liquor licensing to go through uh, all of our various bits and pieces that we need to do for staff training. One of the big things is that it's in the, the handbook, one standard glass of wine, uh, it's 100 mils, so that's one standard drink, but that's one at... I think it's 12 and a half percent. It's the yeah. original thing for it. We're now hitting 14s. 14, 14 and a half, 15. So, so when you so is that affecting like that's wine making? Like we've had the balance, and they've got to get more acidity to kind of balance. Yeah, it does make make the wine making thing. Just just going back to the the RSA stuff though. It means that when you buy yourself a glass of wine, yeah, you are not just getting a standard drink. If it's 100 mils. Which I don't think anyone really does 100 mils. Generally, it's 120 to 150 mils. You're getting one and a half standard drinks. Realistically, you're getting between 1.7 and 1.8 standard drinks. Yeah. And that's really important because the difference between you having a good night out and you going to jail um, might only be a glass of wine. Well, this would probably be just just probably a touch over 100 mils. That's the 150 mark. Mm. That one's good. Yeah, he's got the... That's the one. Yeah. Which means they should be in the bar, right? Yeah, no, yeah. I'm running out of glasses. Oh, okay. Um, So, yeah, that's something really important to note. So, if you are a consumer and you are drinking wine, realise it is not 1.5 standard drinks anymore. So, you'd go, but the 250 mil mark would be two standard drinks. No. That would be like three, wouldn't it? 250 would be two and a half standard drinks on the old measurement. You're probably looking at three standard drinks now. Yeah. See, that's, I mean, the difference between a pot of gold and a pot of 4X bitter, one standard drink, 10 grams of alcohol, and a pot of 4X bitter, which is a 4.8%, uh, and 3.5%, 4.6 now, oh, 4.6, 3.5% is 0.7 of a standard drink. That's one percent difference. Yeah, not much. Not much. And now you're looking at two uh, percent yeah. difference. So I, was, I went the wrong way. I was thinking yeah. 120 mil, but it's not. It's been like 80 mil uh, yeah. standard drink. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, really important that you know that. So, and I'm saying that because one of the best stories I ever heard was a guy, a uh, publican uh, in Toowoomba, um, and served glasses of wine to people, and uh, they got done for drink driving, and they said. I didn't know what I'd drunk. <laughs> Sorry guys, take some responsibility. If you're drinking, you know what you, you've drunk. Don't, don't put it on other people. If you don't know what you've drunk, don't yeah. risk it. Don't risk it. But 
he actually went, radio, and it, it, he got a, a warning or a caution. I don't think he got a fine. He got a warning or a caution because it didn't say anywhere on his menu the standard drinks. Mm-hmm. And he's like, okay, fine. So a glass of wine became $20, or well, the bottle of wine was 25 do you want to buy a glass of wine at 150 mils, or do you want to buy a bottle of wine for 25? Yeah. So after that, it was like, nah, you're on your own. <laughs> so he'd rather settle the bottle and go, it's yeah. because it's got on the bottle, the standard drinks. Anyway, back to the Shiraz. So, it does have a warming note to it. So 40.8 is quite warming. But the power and intensity of the fruit, the, the balanced off to quite an intense oak character. Uh, acidity is there, the tan the acidity is balancing quite nicely with it. Because I'm still my well, chicks are watering. Watering, that's really yeah. grippy. Mm. Yeah, it is quite grippy. The the tannins mm. actually are quite no, rounded. They're rounded tannins, but they're really grippy and fine. Yep. Yeah. It's almost sticking in the tongue. Okay, hold okay. so on, I'll just go back in that. Oh, I see. Yeah, no, they're coming in after. They're coming quite late, aren't they? The acid comes back at the end and, and washes the cheeks a bit cleaner, but yeah. I just find it quite well. Mm. Is that the big the, the tertiary type? No, no, uh, it will be a little bit. It certainly will drop away as it gets gets older. But, um, yeah, no, that's, that's lovely. Oh, hello. Hello. Thanks, Jim. It's a perfect Thanks, Jim. pizza. Cooked pizza. Oh, get the pen out of your head. Thank you, my dear. Yeah, come and fix you up at the... Uh, oh, darling. The yes. <laughs> so, because we're um, heading this, we also like to have, you know, food with our wine. Um, I think we should we should all have a bit of pizza and go back and see what the try wine's like with food. Or should we try the last one too? Oh, all right, we'll do the last one. Now, the Cabernet, now, hold on, I could be wrong about this one. I, actually, 2018. 2018? Yep. It's unusual for these guys. Yeah. That's what I was looking at. Where's it from, though? Cabernet Petit Verdot as well. Yep. Um, uh, light past Bross Valley. It is Brossa, yep. Yeah. So, Petit Verdot. Um, Cabernet in Bordeaux is made out of what's your crap fat? Uh, Cab Franc. Um, Cab. Uh, yep. Cab uh, Petit Verdot. Yep. Um, So there's six traps it works from. If you are drinking a Bordeaux wine, because they planted their grapes so that they would always get a crop, so early in the season, the early, the early um, fruiting uh, stuff will be Cap, uh, Cap Franc, late will be Cap Sauv, the middle of the mid Merlot. Um, Petit Verdot is the very last grape to ripen. So if you have a Bordeaux with a lot of Petit Verdot in it, like because that means they've suddenly got enough petite potato to put into the wine. It shows what's called an exceptional year, and it does turn up in the things as an exceptional year. So this is not a, it's not unusual for Cabernet to be blended with petit potato. Um, normally it's not so here. Not so much in Australia. No, we, we generally blend. Ironically, most of our Cabernet gets blended with either Shiraz or Malbec. Or Merlot. Or Merlot, uh, Merlot if they cab Merlots from WA particularly, they will throw some Merlot in there to to give a bit of red fruit and to, to fill out that hole in the middle. But generally, they will. It's Malbec is a, is a big one, and Petit Verdot to see that in there means that you're going to have to get really good ripe Petit Verdot, mm. and it is quite a heavy, punchy, purple forward fruit style that has a lot of tannin. The Petit Verdot on its own is a tannin beast. Do they do it much as a single varietal in Australia? We have. We definitely did one for a while. Um, I have had a couple of others. I find them too intense and too difficult for me to drink on a, a regular basis. Um, it can't be that like it's up a or something. No, it's about that sort of level. Oh, really? Yeah. There's 
it's got more fruit than Saparabi. <coughs> yeah, it does have more fruit than Saparabi. But it's it's more towards that Jirish sort of yeah. style. Oh, so I haven't had Jirish yet. Oh, we can do, we can fix that. Well, I've only seen it for the first time. Well, so, on this one though, when you, as soon as you taste it, you're getting those blackberry notes and those juvie notes that you expect from Cabernet. But then you're getting a really punchy, almost purple fruit. Mm. Um, big fruit. It's got massive fruit to it. It's not, I don't find it overly fruit forward, like, um, well, it doesn't give me, like, like, I'm getting more fruit out of that than what I did out of the show. Yeah, it's big fruit forward. Um, but the tannin is so intense that it's actually doing the same thing. It's, it's sort of masking a bit of that fruit because of that dryness of the tannins. <clears throat> That's it, I've got those real purple notes, you've got that that really heavy, dense nature. Cabernet from Barossa can be quite dense and heavy, but nowhere near that level. Yeah, I get so, quite like grippy tannins. Yep, you will get that too. Um, generally the tannins coming out of Barossa are beautiful, rounded, yeah. uh, with a slight bit of grippiness to them, but this one is, it's not dry, which is weird. Because you'd think, it, it, being a tannin beast, uh, well, Petit Badeau, being a tannin beast, you think it'd be really dry. And in fact, if you have a uh, Petit Badeau from, from King Valley, it's dry. It's dry. Where's King Valley? King Valley's in Victoria, which oh. is where Debortley pulls its Petit Badeau from. Um, this one, though, is it's quite heavy and dense. It, it gives a real weight and structure to the wine. Um, you know, that being said, though, do you like it? It's probably the biggest question. I think the last two are definitely... Better than going to be better. Going better with food. I probably agree on that one. What's um what's the price point for the cabinet? Same price as everything else, about thirty bucks. Okay. Yeah. If you're really nice to me, so. I, might, I might do it for twenty five. But um so you can see there's really two different styles of wine we're looking at here. We're looking at light medium to the Yeah, light to medium Almost. body to the much greater depth of body. You're naturally looking at it, you'd probably go, I can have a drink with that, or I can have food with it. I can have a drink with that, or I can have food with it. That'll benefit from food, but I can drink it. This one really benefits from food. So, there is a, a prize in the Sydney Wine Show called the Blue Gold. Do you know, you've heard of it? Nope. So, I get a lot of, wine make, uh, a lot of winemakers and, and reps coming to go, um, Do you want the blue shine in here? No. Um, uh, so yeah, so what Sydney's the only one, as far as I know, Sydney's the only place that's got a blue gold challenge. What they do is they take the top gold wines and then they'll actually put it with food, like something to eat. Like a food pairing. Yeah, and that's what blue gold means, it's a food pair wine. So if it gets a blue gold, it means it's not only got a gold, it's got a, you know, it's got the match with food wine. That's way better. Yeah, acidity comes out and makes your mouth water. Mm-hmm. Do you reckon that'll benefit from another two years in age, or what's that? The Cabernet. Yeah. If I was going to write a tasting note on that, I would say drink now, but we'll benefit from yeah more time. Yeah, we're in like two to three years. Two years. Sorry, I don't know how to deal with fish and water. It says here loose carbs. Lovely. That's definitely. Okay, like, cool. a steak with a nice sauce. Mm-hmm. That's why I chose the earthy mushroom pizza. If you're wondering what we're having, we're having Jen's wood fires pizza. We earthy mushroom pizza, which goes beautifully with the wines. Thank you. Good morning. Yeah. You've left me wet, haven't you? No. Nah. <laughs> I've just been waiting for a chance to throw it in. I don't know, mushroom means good mm-hmm. Or mushroom flavour. Well, we're down to two watches. I think it's you and I. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what's your favourite ones? Uh, without great. food, I was going Monty. Yeah. I think I'm going to have to go to Grenache. I think that's really versatile. Like, I, I'd probably buy the Grenache more regularly than I would the other ones. I'd have the other ones for special occasions, but I'd, mm. I could just drink the Grenache by itself. No, I can smash that Monty every day. Mm, that's beautiful. Oh, it's 
Hard come back to the nice shop of the cab though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's something to get that big yeah. acidity. Wow. Good like, wife can hardly taste it, so yeah. Yeah. where's the fruit gone? Yep. Mm. So yeah, that's um that's a really lovely wine. It's a it's a good lineup of wine, see, because the winemaking is very good, despite the fact that, you know, we're, we're talking about these ones being really heavy and requiring food. So who is the wine? The maker? balance is not off. Um, now, they won't tell me. Um, I do know one year they had Michael Hall make some stuff for oh, them. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. And uh, we all know how good Michael Hall is at making yeah, wine. Yeah, pretty decent name. Oh, speaking of which, Michael won Best Small Cellar Door um, from Gourmet Traveller. Which nice. I'm really stoked with. Nice. That was actually he said that it, he said, "Oh, thank you for that." But it's really Phil Lord, who was the the guy who um, looks after his cellar door. Mm-hmm. So he obviously is the one that, that got the award for Michael. So um, that was that was pretty impressive. Yeah, that's good. But nice. um, yeah, um, by the way, you don't win those awards without actually having the wines they enjoy too. So they've, they've got to have good wine. Oh yeah, at there. Good oh, wine, good service. Yeah, good wine, good service, good everything. Well, no, I haven't had a bad Michael Hall wine, so... No, no, I haven't. I actually must admit I haven't had a bad Michael Hall wine. Um, but as for the Pirate Cruise, we are we, we will be doing a tasting with these guys in the next month or so. Uh, probably the next couple of months, actually, I think. Um, they're going to get back up here, uh, I think, late May, early June. Um, so look out for that. And you can actually try all these wines. Is it going to be a dinner or is it just going to be a masterclass? No, it's just going to be a masterclass for the moment because um, we just don't really have any restaurants at the moment that are able to do things. You know, once you've actually, you've got 50 people in your restaurant, if you take 35 of us, take it up. Yeah. I mean, you've got 15 uh, left. It's yeah. And they're not making the money on the drinks, so. No, they're not yeah. making money on the drinks, so they won't do it, so. Yeah. Well, if you want, you can go over to my place and I can make snacks. Oh, snags. Oh, I like snags. Yeah. Rose. Rose is pretty good. Cool. Oh, yeah. Your house. Yeah. yeah, okay, right, yeah. 35 people at my place. Yep. You'll be sitting on the floor and you won't have any plates. You'll be divorced. Yeah, well, we'll be divorced too, that's true. All right, anyway, so um, I thought one of the more rapid ones we got. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. I, I, that's because Pat wasn't doing homework. And yeah, yeah, Pat didn't do homework. We and didn't do shit. Right. didn't even give us a sly wink. I'm gutted by that. No, I did. I did you? Did. Oh, can I see? Yeah. What's it look like? It's, it's going to be a creepy slow wink. <laughs> no, it's two blow winks. Oh, that's a blink. It's <laughs> not a wink. That's anyway, um, thank you all for tuning in today, and we will continue to drink these wines now. Mm. Uh, so, actually, before we do, what was your pick of them? Pat, um, you said, uh, yeah, but going nice. back to it from the Cabernet, like, yep. I might actually switch to the Monty now. Monty? Dan? Um, back to right with Cabernet. Yeah, the Cabernet is pretty good. Probably my pick of them, oh, Jesus, I'm, I'm torn now because I love the Monty, I really like the Monty, and I really like the Shiraz, and I really like the Cabernet, and I really like the Grenache. Um, hold on, so hold, favorite, hold on. Your favourite is Pirate Crew. Yeah. Okay, I'll put the Grenache to the side for a moment. Hello. Definitely that. Just getting filled up with tannins now. Definitely that. <laughs> We've been definitely that. Shit. Okay, let's go back to it. <laughs> yeah, we do promote responsible drinking here. Yes, yeah. absolutely. That's why I'm only sipping. Four sips is a standard drink. <laughs> no, I can't. I can't. Mm. I can't. Right. right. Uh, so you said one, Pat said one. No, all three. No, I'm going to go Shiraz just to say we've got all Sorry. three winners. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, I really can't tell because that is an excellent Monty. That is a stunningly good Shiraz. And that is an, a beautiful Cabernet. So, yep. So you chose Cabernet. You got Monty. I said Shiraz. So we'll all agree to disagree. We'll argue off camera. Mm. Yeah, at the start it was a brilliant Grenache. It was, a, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I still say, the only reason I'm not saying the Grenache in the top there is because... The others have got such intensity of fruit and flavour that you go back to the Grenache and it's just like, what a lovely entry level wine, entry to the, the, the mm. day wine. Yeah. So it's a bit hard to go back. We want it to is. Switch, to old, <coughs> switch back to a white wine or something now. Yeah. I reckon they could yeah. do a pretty good dinner party, just sort of like, you know, that rosé for afternoon stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I really love their Insta Light. Um, Look, yeah. if, if we were going to do a dinner, I would like to see, we'd start with the rosé, mm. we'd then move on to the Grenache. Montepulciano, then we do 
Slurpee the box. Slurpee. Oh, geez, you had to bring that up. Didn't you? <laughs> yeah. Then we have the Slurpee Puppy Grenache. Then we have the Slurpee Puppy GSM. Then we have the Shiraz, William Hunt Shiraz. Then we have the Imster Light Shiraz. Uh, oh, we have the Imster Light uh, Grenache. Grenache. And the Imster Light Mataro. Oh, and yeah, they've got straight Mataro too. And then we have the Cabernet. For, so, yeah, okay. Then we go home from And then we'll go home from that. And Mr. Policeman would ask us to just pull over and stop driving. Anyway, thank you all for turning up. Um, remember to keep an eye out for Pirate Crew Wines. Look for the names that I've said Dante Gabriel, Slurpy Puffy, William Hunt, Imps Delight. They're all the ones that you want to look for. Um, and look for the Pirate Crew label. It is, they, they, they don't do a bad one. Oh, get the sign up there. You want to pass that head down? We'll, we'll, we'll put the sign up quickly so you know exactly what I was talking about. Yeah, we'll look at the logo. So, you'll be looking for that logo. Find it, buy it, it's worth it. Have a great way. Drink well, drink like a savvy. Cheers. Cheers.